is Danny. I'm uh, just a regular kid from Staten Island, New York, who went to West Point in July of 2001, just before the towers came down, and my neighborhood was devastated. All the streets in my neighborhood are named after dead firemen, so I took it personally from a family three generations deep in the fire department. And yet I'm anti-war. I make a living speaking against these wars. That's interesting. That's paradoxical, isn't it? I'm here to talk about the empire. You live in an empire. You think you live in a republic. You live in an empire with 800 military bases in 80 countries, with more aircraft, aircraft carriers than the rest of the world combined, with more military spending than the next seven countries combined, and five of them are our allies. There was a World War I era a British romantic poet named A.E. Houseman. He said in one of his beautiful poems, life to be sure is nothing much to lose, but young men think it is, and we were young. It resonates with me. It's on a grave in the West Point Cemetery. One of my jobs used to be to give tours there. Eight soldiers died under my direct command. Five in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan, three by suicide. That's telling. Dozens, scores, were wounded. Double amputees, single amputees, triple amputees in some cases. So I'm supposed to talk about re-looking at the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And what I want to do is just break down, in hindsight, what those wars were about and the lies that we were all told about them. And I'll start with Iraq. Now, Iraq was my first war. Chronologically, it wasn't the first war. We obviously invaded Afghanistan in October 2001, but I was at West Point during that time. And on St. Patrick's Day, 2003, I was out in New York City with my uncles, firefighters, meeting girls, having a great time, and the United States starts bombing Iraq. And you know what I thought? God, I hope the war is still going on when I graduate so I can go kill and maybe die for my country. That's how I felt that. I'm embarrassed of that now, but it's the reality. So what did I learn about the war in Iraq? What I learned about the war in Iraq is that, first of all, as everyone in this room knows, it was sold on a series of lies. Saddam has WMDs. False. Saddam worked directly with the 9-11 terrorists, right, to attack our World Trade Center. False. And yet we invaded anyway. And I spent my 23rd and 24th years, two Thanksgivings, two Christmases in Iraq. And what did I actually fight there? I fought three insurgencies. Three. And a civil war. Most people don't understand this. First thing we had was the former Saddam loyalists. Sunnis who realized that as a minority group they would no longer rule Iraq if the United States took over, which we did. So they were nationalists and they were Sunni. The second insurgency I fought was the Islamists. Now Saddam did a really good job of squelching out the Islamists. He was actually on our side when it came to terrorism. He was a terrible person, but he was on our side when it came to transnational Islamist terrorism. So the second group that I fought were the Islamists. And the third group I fought were Shias. Shia Muslims who were actually suppressed by Saddam and who still decided to fight the Americans because we were in their country. Because we were in their country. And let me tell you right now, as someone who spent his life, 18 years, of a misspent youth occupying foreign countries. That's what I did. That's what I did for a living. And people don't like to be occupied. They will resist. And so I had three different insurgencies fighting me every day. And oh, by the way, because I was there in 2006 and 2007, they were killing each other. We had unleashed a, a, a Pandora's box of violence by invading and destroying their society. And you know what most struck me and what turned me against the war in Is I would drink tea, chai tea, lots of sugar, getting all chied up with all these regular, regular moderate people 
Arabs and Muslims who think the same way you do, who mostly just want to take care of their own families, right? They've been demonized in our media, but the reality is they're regular people. And what they told me was they said, Danny, well, they didn't call me Danny, they would call me Lieutenant. They would say, Danny, we like you personally, but your country made this a worse place. They would say, we hated Saddam. Danny, we hated Saddam Hussein. But at least under Saddam, men and women could go to a cafe and have a drink on a date together without getting their heads cut off. They would say, at least under Saddam Hussein, there wasn't massive terrorism throughout the country. That's what we brought to Iraq. And that's my sin in which I was complicit. And then there was a Afghanistan, I went in 2011 and 12, when Obama got elected. The great thing about Obama is, look, you don't have presidents, you have emperors. You have emperors. The question is, how do you like your emperor to act? Do you like buffoonish emperors? George W. Bush. Do you like polite, articulate emperors? Barack Obama. Do you like neo-fascist, coarse emperors? Donald Trump, but in the end, you get an emperor, right? And so the second emperor of my time in the army sent me back to Afghanistan to, quote, surge. And we were going to solve all of that. Listen, Afghanistan is an unwinnable war. It is an unwinnable war. We are losing this war. The war is already lost. We just haven't accepted it. Keep your eye on the news. I promise you, we are going to lose that war. We lost it years ago when I was there and I saw it. Why am I telling you all this? Because I think it's really important. We, we've gotten an incredible data at the macro level about the warfare state, about the militaristic nature of the United States. But I was there on the ground. And I'm here to tell you it was all a lie. They need you to believe that the Taliban is the same as ISIS. They need you to believe that the Taliban is coming to take your daughters in the United States, and it's just not true. The people that I fought, that they be called Taliban, Big T Taliban, what they really were? Unemployed farm boys. Now, I wasn't very happy that they were shooting at my soldiers, but I kind of got it. Because I was willing to step outside of the box of my own situation as a US military officer and say, how would I act if I had no job, no prospects, and lived in a country like Afghanistan where they still do agriculture based on 13th century irrigation procedures. You think they're coming to your country? You think they're going to get on a plane? There were zero Afghans on the 9-11 flights. There were 15 Saudis, though. But they're our friends, aren't they? In Saudi Arabia, where they still behead women for sorcery, which is fun. They killed 67 people in one day, beheaded them last week. They were our allies. And they crucified some, that's right. Crucifixion is still an actual thing in Saudi Arabia. What am I saying? What I'm saying is you were sold a bill of goods. And I think if you weren't, because you're in this room, you already know that. The question is, how do we get this message out to the rest of America? that we've been sold a bill of goods, that our soldiers, I joined the army in July 2001. You know what I thought I was gonna do? Humanitarian operations. I believed it too. I was a burgeoning neocon, right? I believed that at worst I would go to Kosovo and I would protect some Albanians and I would, you know, you know pr just protect human rights and I'd find a German wife and everything would be great. <laughs> That's what I thought. And then the towers came down. And I spent 18 years occupying other people's countries. You know, there's not a lot of me out there, not to make myself sound special. We have an all-volunteer army now. There are very few dissenting active duty officers. I was on active duty until February 11th. For the last three years that I was on active duty, I dissented publicly. I wrote articles, I gave speeches, I got in trouble. They threatened to take my pension. The army doesn't like it. Oh, they don't like that when you do what I did. One of my students is here, Gabe. He was there for part of my journey. He saw me as an instructor at West Point, which is also my alma mater. 
he saw me working through this cognitive dissonance, this notion, that, this, this, this sense inside of myself that this is all a lie. And I'm going to end with this. And I think I'll be the first one to probably be able to yield some time for questions. Your owners, you have owners, by the way. Your owners, oh, they're not the politicians. No, no, no. Politicians work for your owners. Your owners are the corporate CEOs who work for the companies that Bill talked about. Right? They count on your apathy. That's what they count on. They count on the fact that because there's no draft, and your kids, and your friends' kids, and your parents' kids aren't liable to be drafted, they count on that apathy, the lack of skin in the game, to keep you fooled. So that we can be at war forever. And people like me, people like my soldiers, who are not from families of bankers and lawyers and doctors, they opted out long ago. Did you know that in World War II, 453 members of the Harvard graduate class died in that war? It was only 38 less than West Point. 38 less than West Point. That has all changed now. That has all changed now. The owners of this country are counting on your apathy. What we need is an on the ground, in the streets movement against these wars. Thank you.